thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be in this part of Vermont where I've never been before, so uh, I guess I'm going to be peeking out the windows a little dark. So uh, while you look at the slides, I'm going to be thinking, is there any foliage still in the trees? So no, huh? OK, sorry to hear it. So I'm going to talk about uh, a Paris that doesn't go up to the Paris that we are the most familiar with today, that's changed Paris that Baron Haussmann did to make enormous broad spaces and clear out the myth went these medieval little areas that were filled with all kinds of germs and darkness. But I think you will see, uh, as someone has just written in a new book on Paris, Joan de Jean, about, uh, about this era of Paris that I'm going to be talking about. Are we okay with this? Yeah. Sorry. Where do you want it to be? Ah, on the outside. Okay, let's see if I can flip this scarf a little bit, my Parisian scarf. Is this better? Make more sense? Okay, good. So, um, it, Joan de Jean wrote an interesting book, uh, just recently published, that emphasizes some of the points that I'm going to talk about. That is that a lot of the idea of Paris as a prominent place for people to visit, for people to display themselves, and something that has an idea of grandeur and greatness, really was something that was developed by kings and even queens earlier on in the 16th through the end of the 17th centuries. So I'm going to be limiting my creating Paris to uh, really a kind of a mad idea that really began under Francis I. And then, it's st is it still flipping? Is it something odd? Can I do something else? Sorry. On another thing? Here? Let's try this. Sorry, folks. It's one of those things. Yeah, you think this would be better? Take off scarf. I think that's the best idea. Okay. That's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> so uh, this whole idea of a Paris that was going to be a capital for a quasi-empire, even though the French were not emperors, or at least by the time Francis I came around in the beginning of the 16th century, he yearned to be an emperor, but he was not an emperor. The one who then, the very important king who succeeded him, who really unified France with the Bourbon monarchy was Henry IV. He also was not an emperor, nor were they popes, nor were they people who really were deemed at that time to have the most symbolic and political capital there possibly was. But in the art that they made, and in the architecture that they built, and in the streets that they made, and in the squares that they constructed, there really was in it a very powerful ideal of empire, and also, believe it or not, of papal authority, which meant spiritual authority in Rome. So I'm hoping I can convince you of this when I show you uh, the following slides. So here's Francis I, painted by Clouet in a rather uh, dominating way. He's seen to be very broad in this portrait. He's wearing a regal hat with a, with a, with a uh, feather in it. He's completely decked out in very rich jewelry and fabrics, which was a sign, of course, of his importance. His material wealth also meant to signify a kind of symbolic wealth, because there was a notion that kings really reigned also by divine right, that they were not, of course, elected, but they really had a, a kind of a particularity that was given to them by God. And this was something that they wanted to use and play on. Now, Francis I, he vowed that he would go to Paris and well, if he didn't exactly live in Paris, he wished to live in Paris. He wanted to stop being a king who was roving around his country, and instead somebody who was going to settle in Paris and make Paris the capital. But when you think of capitals, when you think of powerful capitals that are really are going to be the seat of your authority, you think of, of course, Rome, ancient Rome, imperial Rome. Rome was founded by uh, the 
uh, little twins, Romulus and Remus, who were uh, managed to, well, one killed the other in the end, Romulus killed Remus, then he became the king of Rome, and it was their power to overcome adversity, like not having parents anymore, being suckled by a she-wolf, growing up in nature, that really allowed this sort of myth of the powerful civil civilization that comes from nature and trans transcends nature to begin to have a place. Then, of course, the major figure of all, for really the founder of many an ideal of cities is Augustus, the first Roman emperor, son, adopted son of Julius Caesar, as many of you know. Uh, he was somebody who uh, not only exemplified the power to extend the empire in an imperialist kind of expansion, but also he created peace, which was the strange, as you know, paradoxical wish of all peoples who go out and whack other people out of, over the head and take their land. They also wish to make a durable peace so that that goes, so that they're renowned forevermore after having done their uh, expansion to win over uh, their people and have a profitable time. So Rome was a very wealthy and powerful place. It really did expand its reach all over uh, much of the known world. And in Rome itself, there were buildings like the Pantheon, the temple to all the gods that was admired by not only the Roman emperors who built it, Hadrian rebuilt it, but also then later on all kinds of earthly rulers in other countries, in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, the papacy, and then of course now in France. Here we have what uh, all kinds of humanists did in Rome when they tried to, in the Renaissance, that is the time of the rebirth of antiquity, their kind of rebirth involved in the 15th and 16th centuries, going and digging into all kinds of libraries and archives to figure out what did ancient Rome look like, the seat of all authority. We want to be able to reconstruct ancient Rome again of course, with a Christian ideal behind it. But then, at that point, there was not an idea that antiquity, pagan antiquity, was something that was uh, inimical to, uh, to Christianity. There was an ideal brought about by Renaissance popes that, in fact, you could have a syncretistic world where the power of antiquity was actually merged with the grace and salvific power of Christianity. And the popes were the ones who, in the model of the ancient emperors, were the ones to carry out and spread the light of Christianity throughout all the world. And interestingly, they used ancient models ancient styles, ancient kinds of architecture, and all kinds of things to make that point, to make the point that Christianity was now as powerful as the ancient world. So these um, humanists redid, of course, they not only did they do their sort of archaeological excavations, but they also went, as I said, to libraries and looked for descriptions of things like, what did the Pantheon look like? What was around it? So here you have the Tiber River, an island in the middle of it. We're going to get to Paris in a moment. An island in the middle of it. The Pantheon, circuses, all kinds of columns, uh, more circuses, things that were really emblems of the uh, authority of ancient emperors. This is what uh, the sort of thing that Francis I really wished to emulate. And then the popes, they got in the, into the mix, and they, in the interests of the papacy and for, again, the spread of Christianity, they built things like this, Michelangelo's Capitoline Campidoglio, the head of the, capital, the Capitoline Hill, where in ancient times troops had marched up to sacrifice to Jupiter after, after they had won battles. It's right above the Roman Forum, which is, well, back here. The Roman Forum is under here. The troops would march up to the top of the Capitoline Hill. They would sacrifice and by gum, a Pope, Paul III, and then subsequent popes, with the help of Michelangelo, rebuilt it to make it a Christian imperializing kind of center. Indeed, with an equestrian monument in the center. 
It happens to be a statue of Marcus Aurelius, a soldier philosopher on his horse. But in earlier times, in, that is from the time of uh, the earliest Christianity, this statue was actually believed to have been a statue of Constantine, who many of you will know, although my students don't, that he's the first Christian emperor. I'm just, you, I'm just telling you stuff you already know about, but hardly anybody knows that anymore. What's interesting uh, for a pope, of course, is that Constantine's a perfect model for a pope because he was a, he was in a, yes, yes, okay. I'm asked to move my mic up an inch. Okay, so wait a minute, how about this? Necklace in the back? Even better. Jimmy's the greatest, okay. So um, if it happens again, just catch my eye, okay. So um, the first Christian emperor was an important model because Constantine, although he was, of course, a Roman emperor and had built Maxen he had beaten Maxentius, had managed to embrace Christianity, went one of the stories about Constantine. Not everybody goes with this, but that for the popes, this was a very powerful model because the most powerful man in the universe decided to become a Christian and then build all the basilicas like St. Peter's and St. Paul's outside the walls, all the early basilicas in Rome that would house Christians. It became an accepted religion at this point. So you can imagine the envy of someone like Francis I in France who wished to unify his land, who wished to have the same kind of authority over his people as, let's say, Constantine did, because he was, of course, the roi très chrétien. He was the most Christian king. He was not just any old king. He really had this special authority. So making connections to Constantine as well as to the ancient emperors was a very important idea. We're gonna see how this plays out momentarily. So here we're still with the popes. Pope Julius II, who took the name Julius in order to emphasize that he was like Julius Caesar, he was going to combat throughout the world and win back territory, or win for the first time territory that they wanted. He then not only took this name, he went out on his horse and he rode it at the head of battle. He was a very combative pope, but he also was the first really in the high Renaissance to make a, an entire complex that really resembled an ancient one. So he collected antiquities. Oh, hello. <laughs> Do you think it's a bat or a bird? Bat, I love bats. But do you think it's gotten healed from the white nose thing? I hope so, Bat. I hope you're not rabid. Okay, let me know if it bites me, okay, because then I've got to leave. Okay, I might not notice. All right, so here we go. So this pope, Julius II, collected antiquities because he thought that that was his right as the head of the reborn Christianized Roman Empire, and he put them in his palace. In the, in the, uh, in the, now if you go to Rome, you can still see the Laocoon and the Apollo Belvedere as precious ancient monuments that are housed in the Pope's palace, in the Vatican palace. Then Julius II built these long corridors that that connected the Vatican Palace. You can see here St. Peter's being built. The Vatican Palace, these corridors, were connected to then this museum where this precious ancient work and this precious ancient work with others was housed. Here in this plan, you can see St. Peter's, you can see the corridors, you can see the, this is the Cortile del Belvedere, it's called, and this is the former villa of Innocent VIII that now was a museum. These corridors connected it. So uh, what is so compelling here is that Bramante, the architect for Julius II, was really thinking large. How can I make an ancient style, an imperial style residence with terraced gardens, with collections of antiquity that still has some sort of relationship to me, to my mission to spread Christianity across the world? And indeed, they did this, had this syncretistic thinking. As you might imagine, 
uh, the Apollo was a sign, was since he was the sun god, was related also to Christ. And there was an idea that the Romans who had lived here actually foreshadowed the successful uh, winning over of Christianity, of the world, and this was their sacred place. That prophets had foretold, sibyls, pagan sibyls had foretold this going to happen. So they joined together this ancient and Christian kind of thinking that was uh, very powerful symbolically for all, uh, for all rulers who followed in, into the almost current day. Where's our bat? Okay, just let me know if it starts dive bombing. Okay, so here you see the great interest that uh, under Louis XIV in the late 17th and early 18th century, uh, Louis XIV and his people, his many humanists and workers of the intellectual bent, they took in trying to recreate what Paris looked like in its beginnings. In its beginnings, it was a little Roman market town. At, that is, in other words, the Romans had uh, built the center, this little town in the middle of the island that is in the middle of the Seine River, as you can see here. And under Julius II, this was begun, and roads were built. And it was believed to have been organized in a very rectilinear and straightforward way, the way all Roman towns were organized, so that when you, a soldier, a Roman soldier, or anybody entered into the town, you would know. You turn, you go north and turn to the left, and that's where the marketplace is, and you go south and turn to the right, and that's where the main temple is, and this is where the, so it was very orderly, very rigidly organized. So this was something that appealed to French kings. Already Francis the, Francis I was interested in this, but you can see in this map made for uh, Louis XIV that it was really all, um, that it was really all worked out. Now, we're skipping from the ancient foundation of Paris to the Middle Ages, to the Capetians, who really also began to uh, build, continue to build more and more on the island in the middle of Paris, on the Seine, which was, of course, important to build on an island because you were not only had a way of getting goods to and fro, but it was also a way you could fortify it and you could close it off from potential enemies. So, but I think you can see from this map here, particularly, this is a later 16th century map that shows a wall. The walls were already begun here in the 12th century by Philip Augustus, who built a wall on the right bank to protect the island where the main church was and also the main uh, buildings, the residences were on the island, the Ile de la Cité. And he also built a wall around the right bank, too, where eventually the Sorbonne, the university, was built. So there was an idea of expansionism already in the middle of the 12th century, especially under Philip Augustus. And if you go to Paris, and I'm sure many of you, you have been, if you walk around the Marais, you will still see remnants of Philip Augustus's walls there. It's really, it's an impressive thing. Of course, walls, because you feared, uh, you feared that you're going to be attacked, made all the sense in the world that you'd have to fortify. But people were, well, they kept building more walls because they needed more space. So then later on in the 14th century, there Charles V built this wall. And then Louis XIII built this wall. Louis XIII was the father of Louis XIV, son of Henry IV. And that little sheet, there's a few little clues there to tell you this. I hope I'm not being confusing. Initially, the Louvre, which we think of as a museum, was of course a palace. But even before it was the king's palace, under this guy Charles V in the 14th century, before under Philip Augustus, it was a fortress. It was one of the many fortifications that were meant to protect this precious little town, this precious little city of Paris. Now here is a 16th century map again, late 1575 map again, where you can see, and I'm going to be talking about each of this area, each of these areas, and how they change over time, because they're very profoundly important areas for the idea of Paris and for the actual functioning of Paris. Again, the island in the center. Here 
is the conciergerie, which was the original place, the original palace for the kings, also where the halls of justice were. Everything was compounded into this one area here. And here's a tiny little photograph of it that I'm sure you can't see in the back. Uh, up here is Notre Dame, right here. Not the main, main church of Paris, but the main, that's Saint, Saint Genevieve, which is in a different area over here. But Notre Dame is the one on the island, has a very important role to play because it becomes a gathering place, important central church. Um, over here is the Hotel de Ville, that is the town hall that has the first public square that was built in front of it in, the, I believe, the 16th century. Let me make sure that I'm telling you the right thing. Um, oh, no, it was already in the 12th century. It was a marketplace. But then when the town hall was built, it was expanded. Notre Dame was the one church that actually had a square in front of it. Otherwise, there weren't squares in Paris. In front of the church, in front of this marketplace, and then the town hall is where, uh, is where, these, uh, where these squares were. Finally, we're going to be looking at the Louvre, the former fortress that became a palace, that became an even bigger palace for kings, and then, as we know it now, a museum. Now Francis I. His idea of what it meant to be a powerful king embraced exactly what Pope Julius II was doing in Rome. He wanted to style himself as an emperor redivivus, an emperor redux. So he had Cellini, an Italian Renaissance artist, uh, cast a medal for himself, a coin of himself in profile, wearing a laurel crown like an ancient king would do, a Roman king would do, with a scepter, very much like, in this case, an ancient cameo of an ancient emperor. So even in his visual, in the visual evidence that he's sending around to people who pay homage to him or people he's wanting to impress, he wants to show himself as if he were an ancient emperor. He, too, had himself painted as an equestrian monument, that is, an ancient style emperor or king on a horse, in a more French style, very decorative, very sh making sure that all the gold in the painting shows, different from, let's say, what Titian did in the 16th century, showing the real emperor, Charles V, on his horse riding to battle. But still, the same desire was there. Francis I tried to be emperor, tried to be elected emperor. did not work for him. He invaded Italy. That did not work out well for him either. He was captured, and then he had to give up his kids, and they were captured. So it was all, it, it, he was trying to embrace the uh, Italian Roman imperial heritage, but was frustrated at every turn. So within the capacities that he had, like issuing medals, having portraits painted, and that sort of thing, he asserted his Romanness. As you can see on the back of this medal, uh, I hope you can see, uh, on the back, here is a, the obverse, shows an, a man, a general, or a king on a horse, vanquishing an enemy below. His feet. This is a classic type for how kings, military leaders, should be represented. And Leonardo da Vinci, for example, in a monument that he was developing, that he was sketching for uh, one of the uh, tyrants in Milan, Trivulzio, this is actually, uh, shows the general on top of a rearing horse with a cowering victim at his feet. This was supposed to be on a big base. It never got built. But this is precisely, Francis I is looking to see what's going on in Italy. How can I take that powerful imagery for myself? How can I use this to my advantage? Uh, how can I win minds and people's allegiance by showing myself as a powerful person who has ties back to the earliest emperors of antiquity? Here you see is the uh, courtyard that I showed you before with the collection of antiquities. Here's a picture of the Lakuan, who was, uh, this was a very famous monument. I have to s tell you about this for a moment. This monument showing um, the Trojan priest Lakuan, who warned his fellow Trojans in the Trojan War 
not to accept that horse that the Greeks were trying to give them as a gift. And uh, the gods were not on his side. He was right, but the gods Athena and uh, Neptune, uh, Poseidon, sent snakes from the seas to throttle him and his sons. So this is an ancient statue, a Hellenistic statue, that was described by the great ancient writer Pliny, who described this very work. And it happened to have been buried or lost in Rome, in the city of Rome, in the capital of Rome. And it was dug up in the Renaissance in 1506. And as soon as they dug it up, someone looked at it, maybe even Michelangelo came rushing over and said, this is the lost Laocoon of Pliny. This is it. And so, of course, the Pope, Julius II, immediately said, OK, it is mine. I will take it to my collection. <laughs> because he wanted the most authority there possibly was. And also, it represented um, a kind of a, a, a tragedy, really. A powerful man, this priest rendered as a very powerful man, who was right and yet was killed by the gods. And that kind of pathos was something that was very compelling to artists and even, one presumes, to popes. So, of course, Francis I wanted that lock on. He made a deal. He thought with the successor to Julius II, Leo X, who was a Medici, at a treaty, the Treaty of Bologna. He made a deal with him. He said, OK, part of this treaty is I will get that lock on. And supposedly Leo X said, yeah, probably, sure, yes, OK then. And of course, he did not get the lock on. Of course not. It was a major treasure of the papal collection that showed their uh, likeness to the greatness of antiquity, as I keep saying many times. Francis was having no luck getting any antiquities. He sent his minions out to, uh, to Italy, saying, buy me antiquities. Well, they could buy him a few little broken things here and a few little broken things there, but nobody would sell him their antiquities because it was basically worth something. It was worth not just money. It was worth a kind of ideal of their authority of the past and their linkage of the past to the present. That is worth a great deal, that kind of lineage to them. So uh, the pope did allow his people, Francis the first people, to copy the Laquan. Uh, and uh, a French artist copied the Laquan and cast it in, uh, in, I think it's actually lead. I don't think it's bronze, cast in lead. And it still exists in Fontainebleau. I don't think it's easy to see. But you can make your way there and have a look at it, along with lots of other antiquities from the pope's collection. Imagine that kind of a deal. The pope says, OK, you can't have the originals, but it's all right if I loan you some of the symbolism that has made me so great, that has given me a lot of authority and a lot of power. And so that was what the, uh, the popes did. It was quite extraordinary that that was possible. OK, back to Paris. So in Paris, in 1550, this sort of wish to have the legacy of antiquity and make it, uh, make it a very powerful uh, reality for the French uh, also meant that you're going to have to have a capital. You could not keep roaming around all your, you know, all your possessions, all your chateaus and the Ile de France and all that sort of place. Really, so Francis I decided, I think in 1528, OK, France was going to be the capital. And that meant he would have to live there. Now, he began to rebuild the Louvre, but it really wasn't until his son, Henry II, got on board that he built uh, the Louvre as part of his capital. But again, we'll be looking at, here's the island, here's the Notre Dame, here's the conciergerie, here's the Hotel de Ville with a big place in front of it, and here's the Louvre. So here's the fortress that Philip Augustus built. Then it was expanded, the Louvre, here it was, by Charles V to make it a true grand residence with turrets and everything. And then Francis I's son, Henry II, built this rather magnificent, ancient-styled 
Louvre, made it four times as big as, uh, as this sort of fortress had originally been. So it was meant to be big, and it kept getting bigger. And I think you can see by the captives that are tied up in this ancient style of beautiful, um, beautiful nudes who are captured and the lovely allegorical figures of fame who are on top and the cartouche with his, with his initials in it, all this shouts out ancient legacy except remade in a kind of a French, in a French style. So using the ancient legacy, but in a modernized way. So the Louvre became larger and larger, and then you had to think of the whole picture of the whole city, not just a place, but the whole city had to be drawn together in a variety of ways. Well, there were bridges, some ancient bridges, uh, but they were going to look at this bridge, the Pont Neuf, which is again near the Hotel de Ville and the, and the uh, Notre Dame. This is the island in the center, because now we're moving the Louvre is this way, we're moving outside of that little island, and Paris is safe enough to expand and make all kinds of roads, bridges, and other neighborhoods that didn't used to exist. So, there was a, uh, as many of you know, a terrible time for France and all of Europe. The wars of religion, starting with Protestantism declared by uh, Martin Luther in 1517 that spread throughout Europe and in France, and there were terrible upheavals and burnings, including in the Place de Grève here, this, uh, there's, here's Saint-Jean-en-Grève, here's a terrible kind of a, uh, a burning of, of, of a Protestant happening, or heretics, as they used to think of them as heretics. This all, as many of you know, came to an end because the next king of great import after Francis I, if I can simplify, is Henry IV, who was a new dynasty, no longer the Valois dynasty of Francis I, who'd kind of run his dynasty and run out of gas, run out of sons, but Henry IV was related to him and was able to be this new unifying monarch. And one of the most important things he did was to make peace with the Protestants. In fact, he himself was a Protestant. But in order to be king of France, the, uh, the roi très chrétien, a unifying head of France, he had to convert back to Catholicism. So he did so, but he still had great affection for his Huguenot colleagues in arms, and he felt that the only way really to make France great and grow was not only like Francis I had said, live in the capital, but also expand out from the capital. So he set about making ways to make Paris a rich, uh, profitable place, not just filled with symbolic energy, but actually that was filled with all kinds of um, exciting uh, new material growth. Here you can see uh, Henry IV uh, shown off as a, a Zeus, and here he is in his more truthful guise. But he was not hesitant to take on any of that stuff. He thought, yes, take on the guise of gods. I'm good with that. I want to look like an ancient emperor too. That's fine. If anything could help, uh, that would be it. So he married quite deliberately, uh, for, well, for the second time, he divorced his first wife, and then he married this wife, a very, very staunch Catholic, Marita Medici, who was a Medici from Florence. And to make sure that one understood this as a very powerful Catholic thing, it was not only in prints like this where it showed the cross of the priest who's holding, uh, holding the, uh, who's helping them get married, but the very uh, imagery that's going on of the union of Henry and Rita Medici is, as you can see from these little cherubs, love. So there was now, for the first time, this notion that I'm not just marrying somebody to strengthen the, my hold on the nation, I also want to make it so powerful that it's based on this, what they would have thought of as the Catholic notion of love in marriage. And here you can see even in the Marie de Medici cycle that after his death was painted for his widow, Marie de Medici, Rubens painted Henry, uh, essentially, well, not really, well, Jupiter and Juno up in the sky holding hands. We all know what a loving couple they were. 
not, right? Jupiter had so many mistresses. Juno was always furious, but not in this case. They're happily together because, look, Henry IV has seen a beautiful portrait of his future queen, Marie de Medici. He falls in love with her and all is well. This was a way of making sure that the dynasty was very powerful. He'd seen nothing but crashing and burning of kings who preceded him, Henry IV, and he wanted this dynasty to last. So another thing he did, as I keep saying, is he really structured and rebuilt Paris. So he rebuilt a, a place. He made this very, very important bridge that led from the left bank to the right bank into the Louvre, the Pont Neuf. He made, um, he made a very important development of the Louvre. So let's, those are two things that we're going to look at here. First, this bridge that had been started by his predecessor, uh, Henry III, uh, who was assassinated, and, but it was really completed by Henry IV. It led from the left bank to the right bank. Here is the Louvre. And on it, there was to be an equestrian statue of Henry IV. So of course, insisting upon his importance at following in the ancient tradition, but also this bridge was a new kind of bridge. It was extremely wide. It had sidewalks. It was paved and had paved sidewalks. It was a place where many carriages could pass back and forth. So there, and it was a place where you could have a view of the river. So old bridges had been built up with houses on either side, so you couldn't actually see around the other side. But here, for the first time, was a bridge that was really part of a whole new ideal of a city. That is a city that was one where you could see and be seen, and you could, it, you could actually think of it as, as, as an aesthetic place. On this, on the other side of this bridge, he built a place, that is to say, a series of apartments, an apartment building in the shape of this kind of roughly triangular shape with a square in the middle. Here you can see it from another angle, very close to the Louvre. He didn't have, he wanted to, he wanted to build up the economics of Paris. After the wars, things were a mess. He didn't have the money to pay for the building of this very nice square that's supposed to show off the beauty of the newly reconstructed Paris. He had other people. He said, I'll give you the land, but other financiers took it over and they built these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, pavilions and, uh, and palace fronts that look as though they're all unified. They are all unified. Inside, everybody has his own apartment, but on the outside, there's a unified front. This is one of the main contributions to an ideal of the city, the creation of Paris that we know now. The notion that many, many buildings, it's not higgledy-piggledy, there's not a sort of all sorts of uh, strange differences and heights and buildings, but the notion of everything being unified for a similar goal of beauty and power, that is something that Henry IV was building. A second plus that he built is was called the Place Royale, the Royal Place, the Royal Square, is now called the Place des Vosges. Many of you have been there. It had the same idea. The unified fronts, the beautiful unified fronts with the ledges below, originally it was supposed to have silk worms and silk uh, weavers workshops in it because that was supposed to make a go of it financially. It was these, it was so, so it was not he who was paying for this, but these silk workers were supposed to pay for it. Eventually, uh, upper classes, the aristocracy moved in. It became a very chic, as it is today, place to live. Again, something that later came to have a, a, an equestrian monument of a king in the center, but it was really about the king's creation of Paris without him actually funding it. Very smart fellow. Another thing that Henry IV did that was so important, um, he expanded the Louvre. So here we have Catherine de Medici, who was the queen mother, the married to Henry II, Francis I's son. Henry II was married to Catherine de Medici. And when she, when her husband had died and her sons were in the Louvre, living in the Louvre, she built a whole palace here, the Tuileries Palace, including an entirely gorgeous garden for it outside of the walls 
of Paris, so that she was close to the Louvre, but was not seen to be interfering with anything that was going on in the royal palace. She was not to be interfering with her son's reign, because queens were not allowed to reign. They could advise, but they could not reign. Henry IV thought, this is a fabulous addition to the Louvre. Let me make a whole long connection between the Louvre and the Tuileries Palace, and that's what you see here. That's what exists today. So many of you who've walked in a tired fashion through those many, 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 many long corridors in the Louvre, that one along the Seine is the one that Henry IV built to link the uh, Louvre, the body of the Louvre, with the Tuileries to make the Louvre an even larger place. Now we're skipping to Louis XIV, the Sun King. His grandson, all right, there was a lot of war and messiness in between. We're just going to skip right over that. And we're going to go to Louis XIV, who even as a, as a boy or as a young man, danced in ballets in a, in an, a garment in a radiant attire of the sun. And here's another picture of him as a kind of a warrior general leader. And here's a bust that uh, the Pope's best artist, best sculptor, Bernini, made for him when Louis XIV, as a young man, decided, I need more oomph. I need the person who's creating the imagery for the Pope to come to Paris and help me expand my reach. After all, I'm the Sun King. I can do this. OK. Well, he also loved not so much Paris, but also Versailles. So Versailles was his chateau some miles in the countryside where his father used to hunt. He expanded it and made it a separate, important domain for himself, where all kinds of imagery of himself as Sun King, as Apollo, as all kind of domination over the world and cosmic significance was built in. Here you can see many in this painting, many, many carriages, people coming in, because Louis XIV wasn't just at Versailles by himself. He had crowds and crowds of his courtiers there. He had crowds and crowds of ambassadors paying him a visit there. It became a kind of a center. But it was a center that he could expand completely without problem, because he was entirely in control of it. Whereas the city of Paris, as he had found when there were civil riots when he was a boy, he was not in control. It was more of a frightening place. But Versailles he could control and did control. So imagery of Apollo coming out of the waters in the morning to float across the sky and then going to bed at night. That was there in Versailles. Enormous, these here you can see from this plan, uh, enormous canals that, trans that bisected one another, lots and lots of straight avenues and surrounded by trees on either side that were absolutely geometrical so that you could see a control over nature or perhaps a, a picture of nature as it ideally was. This is even better than what Roman emperors could do because it was showing an entire control of one's entire environment and explaining having that as the picture for the whole world of your authority over your uh, whole, and it stood for your authority over your whole country. So it was like a little place that spoke for your, um, your, uh, your uh, Louis XIV's um, do dominion over the entire world, as he saw. Here are more pictures, again, the canals, these long pathways surrounded by trees on either side. This is going to come back to Paris. You're going to see this does have to do with Paris. I'm just showing you this, not just to take your mind off of Paris, but because this is where uh, Louis XIV and his ministers, Colbert among others, were developing ideas from Paris, even though they were far from Paris. All right, Hall of Mirrors, we've all seen that. In the Hall of Mirrors, there were actually pictures of Louis XIV's success in battle and all his life experiences that were super fantastic. And one of them showed him riding across the Rhine River in a chariot with a, in a gilded chariot, so he was like Apollo, but holding thunderbolts, so he was like Zeus. And Hercules pushing the chariot and 
speeding down the Rhine River, the personification, I hope you can see it here, as the horses go riding over. This is by Lebrun. So these are very explicit, not just relationships to what emperors or gods of yore looked like. This is about saying your, his current way of presenting himself, his current world, beating, marching into Holland, uh, combating Holland, the success in his wars, his current biographical life actually was equatable to God's, the acts of God's, and so forth and so on. Okay. So, the Pope at the time that Louis XIV was a young man and first came to be king was Alexander VII, and he hired Bernini to do things like this. Talk about squares, enormous squares, these colonnades, these ancient style colonnades that however are opened up in an oval form to create kind of almost animated arms for inviting people into the church of St. Peter's here, an obelisk in the center. So Bernini was reshaping all of the space of Rome in order to create an image of Rome that was really cosmic in many ways. Uh, when you got through the colonnades of St. Peter's, you get to the end of St. Peter's, look through this enormous baldachin, and look at the end, and you'd see a heavenly glory with angels popping out and, and shining all around and flying all around to show the power of the papacy and how linked it was to divine authority and blessed by divine authority. Somebody like Louis XIV, who styled himself a sun god and who really did think of himself as having divine power of the Lord, was eager to emulate some aspects of this. So he actually invited Bernini, aged Bernini, who was probably 65, so at that time that was regarded as aged, we now know differently. Uh, invited aged Bernini to go to Paris. The Pope had to give permission because he was giving up, just like the Pope had done to Francis I, he's giving up some of his stock and trade. So this brilliant genius who was able to create symbolism that lent power to the Popes, he was giving him to this young Louis XIV. He did do it. So Bernini made this bust of, of Louis XIV, which shows Louis XIV kind of in a portrait-like form. He actually did studies from him from life, floating as though he were floating in the air on this drapery. He also did an equestrian monument of Louis XIV that people didn't like. It was modeled on what Bernini was doing for the statue of Constantine in St. Peter's. This got stuck in the gardens way back in the gardens of Versailles and said it was, oh, that's Marcus Curtius. It's not really Louis XIV. But um, he also made, Bernini made piazzas in the shape of like ancient circuses, remade ancient circuses in the form of Christian monuments. So it had this marvelous idea of having carving a rock underneath an obelisk, an obelisk that weighed many, many tons and made it look as though it were cracking in half as important figures representing the different continents were throwing themselves back in horror and worry. Isn't this going to come crashing down? As this is a horse that's supposed to be the Danube, part of the emblem of the Danube, leaping through. And of course, it's not crashing down because it's supposed to be a finger of light. So all this light in the tree, something very important to Louis XIV. So Louis XIV builds, has squares built too, larger squares, with equestrian monuments in the middle. Again, paid for by financiers, not by himself. With the same unified facades that Henry IV had done. They're different style, but the same notion of having unified facade to have a unified picture of this city, of the beautified city. Also, he had Bernini make a plan for the facade of the Louvre, which never got built because it was not French enough, too bulgy, too much dynamism, not Frenchy looking enough. <laughs> so 
So Bernini tried again. He said, okay, I'll make it look like Michelangelo's building of the senator's palace on the Capitoline Hill. Okay, we'll do the same thing. Flat facades, the balustrade on the top with lots of statues on top of that. Let's make it look like this. Still no good. This is what the Louvre turned out to be, built by actually French artists. This is on the side of the Louvre that is the east side, about the rising sun, and in fact, many things did subtly get taken over from Bernini by the, in the final version of the Louvre. It has a rusticated base, it has the same flat roof, this here there are statues on top, here there are none, but the same kind of flat facade with the pavilions on either end and a central part in the middle, this is something that Bernini had thought through too. So he's trying to recast his ideas as a French idea. So there was this change of ideas, trying to make bring part of uh, Rome to Paris. And in fact, this statue of Louis XIV that Bernini did that was then remade as Marcus Curtius and stuck in the back. To this day, it turned out that it was brought back to Paris, brought back to the center of Paris and put in the front of the Louvre. Uh, I am Pei cast the terracotta model that Bernini had made and put it right here in front of, as you can see, this glass pyramid. So Bernini's idea of what Louis XIV should look like is embedded in today's Paris. It's there. So finally, what about Versailles was brought to Paris? This is what I think was brought to Paris. They made Paris under Louis XIV into essentially an open city. The wars were not being fought in the middle of Paris. It was fought on the periphery, on the borders of Paris. So they tore down the walls of Louis XIII, and what did they plant in the place of the walls but boulevards? Today's boulevards that we still see today that go all the way around, lots and lots of avenues, flanked by trees going all the way around Paris a whole network of boulevards so that people could ride in the boulevards, display themselves in their carriages, show off their fancy finery, basically it be a place that is kind of a, a kind of a paradise, like Versailles became with all that greenery and the control over nature, kind of perfected place. But now the center of the capital of France was such a paradise. You can see here on these maps, these wonderful boulevards that go all the way around. That was all under Louis XIV. Here you can see he built the Invalide, a place that was, this is under uh, Dwayne Malsac built this. This was meant to be, we think, his resting place. It's now the resting place for Napoleon. But I'm sorry that you can't see that he built just like Versailles, these wonderful formal gardens with these long avenues of trees. And at the, on the other side of the Seine, there is a whole area called the Champs Elysees. This was meant to be built, this church, was built for the soldiers and to commemorate the dead of all the wars that Louis XIV conducted. And right across the way, right below the Louvre, here's the Louvre, right below the Louvre, is this, in the middle of this garden setting is with these straight avenues and boulevards is the Champs-Élysées, which, what does Champs-Élysées mean? Elysian fields, and who's in the Elysian fields? The dead, the dead, right? The dead warriors who live in a kind of a paradise forever. So he is bringing that nature imagery to Paris, to a Paris that is no longer, conf as they are, of course, is not really true over the long run, but he's proclaiming it as not a conflicted Paris, not a place where Paris is going to have any sort of trouble, a place where you can be in nature and live as in a kind of a paradise among the bodies of the dead, as happily living as those who are living. So it's a kind of wonderful imagery, symbolic imagery that really came from ancient times, brought through the Christian era, and then uh, imposed upon Paris in a way that we today have pretty much forgotten, but it is there. If you walk through Paris, you can walk all along these places that Louis XIV made or had his people make. Okay, thank you very much.
I'm happy to answer anybody's questions. I can't say I'll know the answer, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, the Louvre was, it's true, built in stages, but it really only took, when Louis XIV's Louvre facade was built, it was just a couple of years, if that. It went fast. They poured their resources into it, even though Louis XIV was really living in Versailles. It was worth it to them to have Paris be a prominent capital. I think, uh, you mean, so... So they built the bricks, they actually build the building. How long would it take in those years to do that? I think uh, to build the part that was built for Louis XIV, that front part, uh, was a probably a couple of years, okay. I think. I'm, I'm not helping you sufficiently, but not that long in, in, from the way I understand it. It's not that long, because they put money into it. As far as I understand, they had stopped thinking of Paris as a place where warring would take place. That was really now on the outskirts of, of the nation now. It was no longer supposed to be happening in Paris. This is what I've read. It could be, could be otherwise. That's not to say that they didn't use military kind of engineering to make it happen, to tear down the walls, to build new avenues and all that kind of stuff. But I think of the Champs-Élysées, the original Champs-Élysées, not today's shopping paradise Champs-Élysées, but the original Champs-Élysées, completely surrounded by fields of trees, I think that was really meant to be a kind of a, a, a sacred garden in some ways. That's, that's how I think of it. Yes, in fact, I didn't tell you about the Ile de la Cité, but that was a, a model of non-medieval street, in sort of under Louis XIII and 1620s and 30s, the Ile de la Cité was built with these very regularized streets and proper paved and uh, unified facades and all that sort of stuff. So opening up and making it regularized and all that was already happening long before Haussmann. That was, it was true of Haussmann, but it was also a kind of a mythologizing of Haussmann. That's a good question. So this, uh, the question is, when was this image done? This map was made, I think, around 17, uh, 1750. I'm, I'm trying to, I should know. Before so yes, 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 before Haussmann. So where's Place de la Concorde is off this map. Actually, it's, it's down here. It's down here. I think it's down here. Here's the Champs-Élysées. They lead to the Place de la Concorde, right? Am I right? Am I remembering this right? Wait, wait, wait. So, so the, um, it's, uh, here's the Louvre, and the Ile is up here. So the Champs-Élysées are here. Here's the Invalide. There's this axis that leads across the Invalide. And so I can't see where the Place de la Concorde was, uh, was, uh, was built, because I think it's down here, because he built whole buildings on either side of it. Those were built already under late Louis XIV, buildings around the Place de la Concorde. Ah, oh, yes, that is it. That is it. Thank you. Yes. Right. I got mixed up. I got to go back. Somebody's got to fund me to go back. And soon. Yeah. So the question was, was there gentrification? Absolutely. What Henry IV and then Louis XIII and Louis XIV were doing, they were making these streets that were going to the north and south, to the east and west, and then they began to make it possible to have neighborhoods. So these plus, these squares, were really built to enable entire new neighborhoods to be built. So it's off of this map, and I'm trying to think where I can show you, like the, um, no, this is the wrong place. The, um, yeah, I don't have a good map of the Marais, but I wanted to show you. Anyway. So the Marais was a 17th century neighborhood, then on the left bank, on either side of the, of the, um, of the uh, Invalide, that was a new neighborhood. So there are these whole areas that were completely built according to these logical plans, and a lot of people were putting tons of money into living there, building them. It's especially as soon as Louis XIV left Versailles, there was a rush of people into Paris because uh, the courtiers could go back to Paris and build their own hotels, things like that. 
So the finance, because the, because the royal house, the royalty did not have the money to develop these neighborhoods and all these, even the squares. They couldn't even develop the squares. So people, the financiers, people who had money, let us say, made money in land, maybe they made money in certain kinds of speculation, they, uh, they had the money that they then put into these, building these houses and these squares, and then they could rent them out or sell them for a profit. And so it was a way of financially affording this expansion and improvement of Paris. What happened to everybody who lived there? I think everybody who lived there went, as they do, to the periphery. I think, I think that was what happened. And so the center of Paris that we know now, that we can walk across, was a kind of a, uh, a sort of, a, you know, gentrified, utterly gentrified area, and I don't think people could afford to live there naturally, you know, as you might imagine. It was not a good model for now, right? <laughs> Yeah, no. As far as I know, no. Uh, as opposed to Florence, in the uh, Florence, was there a master plan? Uh, so Florence had a master plan in the late Middle Ages that everybody stuck to. It's just say, yes, we're going to rebuild the, you know, the baptistry and the cathedral. We're going to rebuild. The, we're going to put doors on it. We're going to have a town hall. We're going to have a straight path. That was not the case. And and I think I don't know enough about this, but I think it's possible because um, there was so much upheaval, like there would be a successful um, you know, royal moment, a dynasty for a little while, and then there would be a revolution, or there would be some sort of revolt. They would have to flee. It'd start again. So it was very hard for people to continue what had been done before. Henry IV did try to continue what had been done earlier by the Valois. He wanted to look as though he was the continuation of the Valois, but uh, it, was, it was tough. They, they didn't do it as successfully as other places, I would say. So anyway, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for all your questions. Appreciate it.